Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Today, Congress passed a $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief bill. It will provide many Americans with $1,400 stimulus checks and extend weekly emergency unemployment benefits into early September, giving President Joe Biden the first big win of his presidency. Also included in that relief package, a historic tax credit that could help lift children out of poverty. The current $1,000 yearly child tax credit has been expanded for one year a $3,600 credit for every child under age six, and a $3,000 credit for every child ages six to 17. Jesse Degliato says for their mother, they're about to meet uh, what will now be monthly payments are badly needed during this pandemic. As a single mom, Rosa Esquivel has struggled to support her two little girls. She works part-time at the House of Neighborly Service on the West Side, delivering meals to homebound seniors and getting its clients the help they need. I mean, it can get pretty tough, but I've always managed to pull through. Maybe it won't be as tough now that Congress has passed the COVID relief package with an expanded child credit included. It'll mean $250 a month for each of her daughters, Celeste, age six, and Araceli, age seven. Money their mother says will go a long way. Stay up to date on my bills, buy healthy food for my girls. To put food on the table, to pay you know, their bills, their electricity, their water, and to have a roof over their heads. Unlike what she says critics of the relief package are predicting, that child tax credit funds will be misused. Ultimately, as a parent, you put the needs of your child first. Even if the expanded tax credit isn't permanent, Esquivel says she likes being self-reliant. Do what I have to do, stay on my feet. Doing so could be somewhat easier thanks to a historic effort to reduce child poverty. I just feel like this is a good start for many families. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. The city of San Antonio still has tens of millions of dollars to dole out to families struggling to pay their rent or other bills because of this pandemic. City staff gave an update on the emergency housing assistance program during a committee meeting today. Our Garrett Berger joins us live now. So Garrett, what do people need to know about getting some of that help? Well, Myra, you have to be able to show you've been affected by the pandemic and meet some certain certain income thresholds, but you can still get help even if you've hit previous limits for the program. Now, this program has been popular since it began last year, and over the past year, $133.6 million has been put into the city's emergency housing assistance program in different chunks throughout that past year. Now, the most recent and largest addition was just last month, and it's a big reason that more than 43% of that pot of money is still available. Depending on your income, you can get up to nine months worth of rent, utilities, and internet paid for. And a recent reset of the program's limits mean that even those who maxed out the help they could get from the EHAP before can get help again. You just can't double dip for the same period you already got help for. So if that person got the uh, received April, May and June of last year, we cannot pay for April, May of June of last year. We would be we could only pay for uh, as an example, if they were um, in the arrears for December, then we could be December. We could be January, February, March, and um, uh, future uh, future rent, uh, one month of future rent. A word of warning, though, last month's winter weather and power crisis has slowed down how quickly the city can turn around the applications and get bills paid. But staff say they do have more people to help now. The city is also providing rental assistance for people who live outside of the city limits, but inside of Bear County. So, county residents, you can apply too. In the newsroom, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thanks, Garrett. A new phase in the vaccine effort in Texas. State health officials announcing today that Texans age 50 and older will be eligible to get their COVID-19 vaccine starting Monday, March 15th. That means the state is opening up to phase 1C. We detail what else that means. You can find all of this laid out in an article on our website at ksat.com. Local businesses sharing split opinions about the mask mandate ending and businesses allowed to reopen at full capacity. 
Connie Turner, a retired Air Force veteran, and Rick Moreno bought the Bananas Billiards in 2018. Turner says due to COVID-19, they were shut down for seven months with zero revenue coming in. Today, they are reopening at 100% capacity. They are encouraging guests, though, to wear a mask and not requiring it, though. But several businesses at the Pearl have not changed their policies, many still requiring customers to wear masks. We have plenty of room for people to kind of naturally social distance. We just want everybody to feel safe and enjoy their time with us. At Southerly Fine Food and Brewery, customers must wear a mask when they enter the building. Even though they are allowed to open at 100%, they are still operating at 50% due to safety concerns. Well, it is official. The state mask mandate is over in Texas. So will you still be wearing one? Many say that now more than ever, they will be vigilant, something doctors at University Hospital are applauding. Ursula Perry shows us why now may especially be the time to wear a mask, or maybe even two. Responsible mask wearing has been the motto for many months now. Even though the state has lifted the mandate for doing so, many doctors are unmoved. And the hope is that many people will continue to wear masks because uh, the mandate doesn't prohibit them. Uh, but certainly some uh, individuals will choose not to, and that will put other people uh, potentially at risk. In fact, the chief medical officer at University Hospital says now more than ever, you should consider where you're going and even how many masks you're wearing. Uh, wearing a double mask or two layers, uh, that might be something you want to consider as well, because there are individuals who won't be uh, perhaps in higher numbers, and that's uh, of concern. Here's where the doctor is coming from. The CDC put out its morbidity and mortality weekly report late last week, and it showed a study from late last year of what happened when the mask mandates went into effect. Well, it showed a decrease in the number of cases and in deaths. It showed mandating masks was associated with a decrease in daily COVID-19 case and death growth rates within 20 days of implementation. Then, on the other hand, allowing on-premises restaurant dining where mask use was not continuous was associated with an increase in daily COVID-19 case growth rates 41 to 100 days after implementation and an increase in daily death growth rates, 61 to 100 days after allowed in. Bottom line, it's personal choice, but one you should consider. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Take a look at your screen. Do you recognize this vehicle? San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers are looking for the owner who had important information related to a sexual assault case. The crime happened on December 12th in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven off of Fair Avenue. If you have information that could help investigators, you can call your tips into 210-224-STOP. The numbers are staggering. That's how the Comal County District Attorney describes a spike in domestic violence cases. Paul Venema takes us to the DA's office there where they've set up a division to deal exclusively with this problem. Yep. Using federal grant money, just over $73,000, Comal County District Attorney Jennifer Tharp has created a two-woman division to focus on crimes against women and domestic violence cases. Tharp says the numbers dictate the need. Domestic violence arrests last year in Comal County were at 66% compared to 53% in 2019. Even staggering is looking at the latter half of 2020, where we saw 82% of our law enforcement arrest being related to domestic violence, intimate partner type of crimes. The county sheriff, like the DA, blames the soaring numbers primarily on the pandemic. The stressors brought on by the, the epidemic itself and the usage of, of alcohol and drugs brought forth the, uh, a number of domestic violence uh, cases last year. Cases that the DA says are unique and demand the special division. They share property, they share children, they share finances. It is a unique type of offense and it's a difficult position very often for that victim to go through. Time, Tharp says, is critical. What we're looking at is addressing these cases on a faster track with greater training and experience. Like most everyone in the judicial system, Tharp worries about the impact of the COVID-19 case backlog. I don't want domestic violence 
victims to not report because they feel like the case is going nowhere by virtue of these court delays. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a live look outside with live cam on this spring break Wednesday. Some sun going down out there. We saw a lot more sun today, or a little bit more sun, a little bit more humidity, and plenty of wind. Yes, that wind is probably a nuisance at times, and it's going to be hanging around for the next several days. So get used to the wind. Unfortunately, today's almanac, a low of 64. Our average low this time of year is 50. We made it up to 82 this afternoon. That high temperature, 10 degrees above average for this time of year. That's also going to be hanging around the next couple of days warmer than average temperatures, both in the mornings and afternoons. A look down to the southwest. High temperature in Catula today, 92, 88 in Carrizo Springs. So plenty of warmth across a good portion of the area. We've got a lot of clouds out there, especially west of 35. As you get out closer to Del Rio, maybe a few little sprinkles there between Del Rio and Eagle Pass, but really just an abundance of cloud cover out there on this Wednesday. Here's a look at our current sustained winds out of the south southeast, bringing in the humidity anywhere from about 10 to 20 miles per hour and it will be staying breezy this evening, even a little gusty at times. We could see some wind gusts for the next several hours up closer to 30 miles per hour. So overall this evening staying breezy and mostly cloudy with temperatures falling to near 70 by 11 p.m. Not much is going to change over the next couple of days, but we do have better chances of rain in the forecast by the weekend. More on that coming up later in the newscast. The numbers lately have been promising, but the message is still certainly clear from the mayor and the county judge about not letting our guard down just yet in the fight against this pandemic. Let's go live now to the daily briefing for the latest numbers. COVID-19, which brings the total number to 199,065. Our seven day rolling average has dipped to 168. Unfortunately, we do have three new deaths to report this evening. We've now lost 2,856 of our neighbors, friends, and family members to COVID-19. As we remind you every night, please keep their friends and family in, our pra in your prayers this evening. Uh, each one of these numbers that we re have reported over the year is a loved one uh, who is deeply missed. We are seeing more improvements in the hospitals tonight. There are 250 COVID-19 patients in local hospitals. This is the lowest number of patients, again, we've seen since early November. That number continues to tick down. There are 34 new admissions in the last 24 hours, 112 patients in the ICU, and 73 are on ventilators. Again, with the numbers moving in the, direction, in the right direction, please do not let your guard down. We continue to ask you to wear masks and practice social distancing uh, as we continue to get vaccines out in our community. And speaking of vaccines, as of yesterday in Bear County, we now have 306,754 people who have received their first dose and now 180,625 people who are fully vaccinated. Today, the state did announce that phase 1C of vaccination eligibility will start on March 15th. This will include those who are 50 and older, an age group for which there is strong and consistent evidence of COVID-19's life-threatening effects. Preventing the disease among people in this age group will dramatically reduce the number of Texans who die across all races, ethnicities, and occupations. As Texas progresses into the 1C category in the coming weeks, the state will continue to work with vaccine providers and other local partners to ensure that people who are eligible in all the phases right now, phase 1A, 1B, and 1C, do have access to the vaccine. So let's again continue to wear our masks and social distance as we work to get more people vaccinated in our community. Let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And uh, yeah, all the numbers are certainly moving in the right direction. And, uh, you know, I was out at Lowe's, I guess, today, a couple of places. And everywhere I went there, people were wearing face masks. A friend of mine was at North Star Mall, which is a lot of people there. He said just very few people didn't have them on. So I think most, by far, the vast majority of citizens are responding to individual responsibility. And let's hope that they uh, keep that up so we can get out of here, out of this terrible thing. Uh, this Saturday, we're going to do a little different uh, in terms of the vaccinations. We're going to focus on health care workers that have missed getting their shots. And we're also going to take Edgewood Independent School District, Northeast, and Harlandale as we work through their superintendents. Uh, so we'll be doing all of that Saturday out at uh, Wonderland Mall. 
Uh, again, I want to highlight the businesses that are continuing to do the mass program. Uh, it's really uh, en- enlightening to see many of them do that. Uh, Black Laboratory Brewing, a, a bar doing it, Clementine Restaurant, Curly Boy Barbecues. There's some really cool names here. The Dog Father on San Pedro, that's hot dogs. And the Drink Tank, he's going to continue to do the, ma- uh, do the mask. Uh, Paloma uh, Blanca Mexican Restaurant on uh, Broadway, owned by Richard Peacock, is going to continue to do it. And Goodwill, uh, they have 1,500 people working there. And they're going to continue to do all of, uh, all of it, the great clips and limited sports academy. So the business community is really stepping up and, and helping us a, a great deal on this. I'm kind of excited about this coming Friday, not tomorrow, but the next day. Uh, it will be the first game in the uh, arena today for the Spurs. Uh, they are going to hold their attendance down to just 22% of the available seats. Uh, they're going to have – require mask, temperature tests before you come in, uh, very responsible. We've also spent 2238000 on the A&T Center preparing it for uh, uh, COVID. Uh, we have a touchless ticket scanner, hand sanitizer locations. We have touchless plumbing. Uh, we've got plexiglass barriers. We've got a, a H- HVAC air conditioning and heating system that's going to generate more fresh air, and it's important to do that because it will travel a lot quicker without good fresh air. And we made a number of other improvements to it. So I think you're going to be safe uh, going to the game, and uh, we hope the Spurs uh, come through and win a game for us. Great. Thank you very much, Judge. I, I do want to remind you that uh, if you'd like to sign up for vaccine alerts as, they, as appointments become available, you can do so by texting vaccine or vacuna to 55000. Uh, you'll get a text alert as soon as there are more appointments available at any one of the public labs. Okay, continued good news this week from the daily briefing for the third day in a row. Cases down, the seven-day moving average also down. Vaccinations way up, now saying uh, in Bear County, First dose of people, 306,754. Meanwhile, 180,625 that are now fully vaccinated. And then again, on March 15th, they're going to move to phase 1C, which includes anyone 50 and over. And we have all of that again spelled out on our website, what phase 1C means as far as uh, the number of new cases, fewer than 196 reported today, three new deaths. Uh, did come in today's report, but I, I can't remember the last time we had fewer than 100 new cases yeah. of COVID confirmed in our community. We also heard uh, the county judge there talking about the efforts, the money that the county has put into the AT&T Center, which will for the first time be welcoming guests, uh, fans in this pandemic on Friday. More than $2 million that they have spent to upgrade the AT&T Center. Things like touchless ticket scanners, plexiglass. We've actually done a story on that. So if you're heading out to the game on Friday, you can go to our website, check that out and see exactly what you will see when you get there all to keep you safe. And starting out at just 22% capacity for that first game. We'll see how things go from there. Keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. All right, let's check in with Katie Blake for today's weather. Yeah, long story short, we're not going to see a whole lot of change over the next couple of days. So the wind will be hanging around. It'll be staying unseasonably warm and also humid over the next several days. Our changes kick in late Saturday and by Sunday we'll be back to a good amount of sunshine. So looking ahead to the weekend, if I had to pick a better day for you, especially if you want to do anything outdoors, it's definitely going to be Sunday and you'll see why coming up here very shortly. Wind gusts forecast into Thursday. Yes, our wind gusts will still be up there tomorrow as high as 35, even 40 miles per hour at times on Thursday. So windy conditions conditions will persist Thursday. I see very, very similar wind gust numbers into Friday, even Saturday as well. So here in South Texas, we're staying warm, humid and windy for the next several days while a storm system approaches from the West Coast. This low pressure system will be moving closer to the Rockies by late Friday into Saturday, but by Saturday night starts to drop a cold front through portions of Texas. This front will kind of clip us here in San Antonio and South Texas. All the potential for any severe weather is going to be up in North Texas, North of I-20 up into portions of Oklahoma and the Central Plains. So we'll kind of get clipped by the energy, but we still do expect a scattering of some showers and some rumbles of thunder again. That will be late Saturday with things clearing up by Sunday. Until we get there, though, staying warm, humid, 
and windy for the next couple of days. That includes your Thursday 65 tomorrow morning, 83 in the afternoon. And again, very similar story Friday into Saturday. A couple of additional showers and rumbles of thunder are possible Saturday afternoon, but our best chance of rain will come Saturday night as we spring forward. Don't forget about that time change. Oh, guys. I, I don't think we will. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Uh -huh. All right, as Larry just walked by, he showed me some breaking news concerning the Spurs. Yeah, we saw the Spurs uh, injury report and it said LaMarcus Aldridge is not with the team. A couple of minutes later, Sham Sharania of The Athletic tweeted, Spurs and LaMarcus Aldridge have mutually agreed to part ways and are working on a resolution, says head coach Greg Popovich. That's all we know at this moment. In the meantime, Spurs will take on the Mavs tonight. Apparently, L.A. will not be with them. And Astros right-handed pitcher Forrest Whitley is done for the season. Coming up. Nice five day break. The Spurs will tip off the second half of their season tonight at the Dallas Mavericks. And San Antonio is close to having its full roster. Devin Vassell is out for conditioning. Quindary Weatherspoon is with the G League. And Lamarcus is listed as out and not with the team. More on that in a second. The long awaited return of Derek White, Rudy Gay, and Lamarcus. Well, actually, not Lamarcus should provide the Spurs with a nice boost tonight. Lonnie Walker was asked if there is a sense this team is getting a reset, refresh after the All Star break. Absolutely, uh, for sure. You know, we got a lot of players who are well, well rested, you know, ready to go. And um, we also got to decompress, you know, consume what we did on this, this first half of the, of the season and, and see what we can do better. And um, now we're ready to, we're mentally focused, physically focused onto the second half. Dallas comes in as one of the hottest teams in the West. They've won three in a row, eight of 10, and 10 of their last 13. This after a six game losing streak dropped into eight and 13. Now they're eighth in the West and looking to move up even more. I don't go into the second half of the season. We want to keep the momentum going. I mean, every one of these games is going to be important. Um, you know, San Antonio's, um, they're leading the division right now. And, uh, you know, we're the hunters. We're, we're trying to keep moving up. All right, the Mavs will host the Spurs tonight at 7.30, so LaMarcus Aldridge will not play. Head coach Greg Popovich mentioned today during his pregame presser that the Spurs and L.A. have mutually agreed to part ways and are working on opportunities elsewhere. In boys high school basketball, the Cole Cougars held off Little River Academy 59-50 in the Class 3A semifinals at Buda Hayes High School last night. Cole led the entire game, but it wasn't easy. Junior guard Silas Livingston led the Cougars with 21 points. And junior guard Trey Blackmore added 18. A year ago, they advanced to the Class 3A state title game, but didn't get to play in the finale because the game and UIL tournament was suspended, then canceled due to COVID-19. We were very motivated this year, you know, uh, man, because the year before we had lost before the ch state championship and last year it was canceled due to COVID. And so we really wanted to get back this year and we worked really hard every day and we got here. I'm just really proud of our guys for just locking in this whole playoffs with COVID, with the ice storm, with losing key players. Um, they never wavered and it's tough. You know, we've been here three years in a row and and, you know, everybody comes at us. Everybody wants to beat us and they answer the call every night. Cole will take on the Tatum Eagles for the Class 3A state championship Friday 2 p.m. at the Alamo Dome. Cole ended the regular season fifth in the state, while Tatum was 10th per the Texas Association of Basketball Coaches. And in the TAP 6A state final, Antonian will square off with Dallas Bishop Lynch Friday night at 8 at 8 a.m. Consolidated High School and College Stadium. College Station, I should say. Antonian is second in the state. Bishop Lynch is sixth by the TABC. And Houston Astros top prospect right-hander pitcher Forrest Whitley will have Tommy John surgery, manager Dusty Baker said today. Whitley was diagnosed with a sprained ulnar collateral ligament in his right elbow on Sunday after feeling some discomfort while throwing a batting practice session last week. Whitley received a second opinion before opting for surgery. He's a talent that, that's been on and off the disabled list or on and off, uh, you know, the injured list. Uh, and so finally, hopefully we can, um, um, uh, you know, do the operation and then his career can can skyrocket from there once he's ready. And Baker said it's a temporary setback. And of course, Greg will have much more on this L.A. story tonight. Always a tough surgery to, to get over. It is. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Larry. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. 
For years, he was a leader within the city in the effort to redesign Alamo Plaza. Then last week, Mayor Ron Nuremberg removed him from his positions, adding to what has been a contentious battle over how we all remember the Alamo going forward. In today's KSAC Q&A, we are joined by District 1 City Councilman Roberto Trevino, now a former member of the Alamo Management Committee and former tri-chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee. Thank you for joining us, Councilman. I think the first question, this is the first opportunity we've had to talk to you. Your reaction to the events of the past week? Well, it's it's uh, obviously it's very disappointing uh, to uh, to put in six years uh, of, of hard work. Um, work that I was very proud to be a part of, and most importantly, it it was a, a team effort. A lot of a lot of great people have have come together to to get to where we are today. Uh, it's uh, it's such an in, incredible project. Um, we did a lot of great things working together, and again, it wasn't just me. Uh, it was quite a lot of folks uh, that were involved in this. And some talented professionals. Uh, it was a great partnership at the management committee, and uh, you know I, I I'm hopeful that uh, there'll be steps that uh, will move the city forward and move this project forward. Uh, however, obviously I'm I'm clearly disappointed that uh, the lieutenant governor would single me out in 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 many uh, platforms and ask uh, the mayor to remove me and the mayor removed me. So, and the mayor framed your removal as necessary to move forward after the Texas Historical Commission said the Cenotaph is not moving. The large white monument that's right in front of the long barracks there in Alamo Plaza. So do you feel like you were digging your heels in on that very issue, which has become such a hot button one for so many people? Was that a sticking point for you? No, actually, uh, let's let's be clear. What what the issue was is, is that I what I wouldn't bend on was the the position that uh, the city was beginning to negotiate with the state on spending city dollars on state property we shouldn't be doing that 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 just i think is irresponsible and uh, really begs uh, us to ask a lot of questions of why are we why would we spend millions of dollars uh, on state controlled property it was never part of the deal and certainly we still don't even know what we're going to do in this redesign so uh, all I ask is that that people take a look at uh, take a closer look at uh, how we are negotiating this uh, new lease. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of details. We spent years getting to where we got to on the current lease. There's no rush to to redefine it. Uh, so I think we should take our time. And uh, a lot of people, I think, have have uh, approached me and said, you know, they they don't understand either why. Why we're doing this at this time? Uh, the the issue for me again is simply the city, which has the the least amount of, of funds allocated to this project, and and of course we have uh, the least amount of revenues, is is proposing to spend money millions of dollars on state controlled property. And nobody understands what we're getting out of that. And that's something that I, I wanted to touch on because a lot of people, I, I think they don't understand the lease between the city and the general land office. You and I did an interview days before your removal from these positions for an episode of Case That Explains. Diving into all of that, that's out there for people who want to dive into that information as well on our website. But you talk about the lieutenant governor getting involved in this. This has become a politicized issue, certainly over the last several years. Do you think that that has led to the message of why the Alamo is being redesigned in the first place, led to that being lost? Yeah, I, well, I think uh, we're, we're what, what's been lost is all the great work that went into the, the current master plan that we all know and the current lease. Uh, it went through um, hundreds of uh, public meetings. It had a lot of uh, incredible professionals, design professionals, uh, spend time to, to really come up with what we thought was going to be a world-class project and um, only to be uh, you know, uh, met with uh, resistance from the lieutenant governor who, who uh, was very, very concerned about uh, you know, only telling the 1836 battle, which we've always said we, we're not going to do that. We're going to be telling a complete story. And I also want to be clear when it comes to the Cenotaph, 
absolutely nobody ever made a big deal about the cenotaph itself. But this isn't about the cenotaph. This is about all the components of the master plan that were adopted and voted for, including the mayor. Um, you know, we all agreed that this was the plan we would all move forward on. And so uh, we're advocating for elements of the plan as agreed upon to, to move forward. It was spelled out in the lease. And that's why it was important to move forward with all those elements. As a result of the denial at the THC, uh, the the major contributors, major uh, contributors to to uh, to raise that were going to raise several hundred million dollars to build a world class museum, all left. Uh, they this is uh, something that they were very serious about. Uh, the the lieutenant governor and John now at the at the Texas Historical Commission uh, dismissed that threat uh, as as something that could be renegotiated and that, that that they could redesign the plan and unfortunately that's what seems to be happening as the plan mm-hmm. is being redesigned and again my my only real concern right now is that as, as before i was dismissed um you know m- the issue i was raising was that the city is is proposing to spend millions of dollars on state controlled property which was never part of the deal basically leaves us uh, holding the bag for the infrastructure improvements we were supposed to make around the area. This th- That's our responsibility as a city, to improve uh, a lot of the infrastructure around that area to, to help make this a more successful project. Um, but at the, in the end, again, it's, it's, it's a, as you said, a complex project. It's got many parts. You still don't know what the design is. It's mm-hmm. going to take some time. And I just don't think we should be redoing a lease without fully understanding what it means and what the city is getting out of this. Councilman, this is about- I appreciate all of your time. Unfortunately, we're out of it on our end, but there are so many different layers to what's happening with this project. And I, I again want to point people to the direction of the interview you and I did uh, just a couple of weeks ago. KSAT.com slash explains, get a better understanding of the timeline where the plans stand now. Thanks so much for your insight, Councilman. Thank you. We'll be right back. One of the Wisconsin women convicted of stabbing a classmate in 2014 will have a hearing on a petition for early release in June. A judge set the hearing on Wednesday. 19-year-old Anissa Weir was sentenced to 25 years in a mental health institution in 2017 for her role in the so-called Slenderman stabbing. When she was just 12 years old, Weir and Morgan Geyser lured classmate Peyton Lettner into the woods for a game of hide-and-seek and then stabbed her 19 times. Lettner survived. Weir and Geyser told investigators they did attempt to murder their friend to please Slender Man, who was at that time a popular internet horror character. We'll be right back. Clorox is evolving its marketing strategy to focus more on businesses. Clorox saw a massive demand for its cleaning wipes when this pandemic hit. And as more people get vaccinated and restrictions are lifted, more people will venture out and about. Clorox has partnered with companies like United Airlines, Uber and AMC to use its wipes to keep surfaces clean. As for if those wipes will be available, Clorox says it's ramped up production and does not expect the same types of shortages we saw last year. Still sometimes difficult to find those things. It it is. I was going to say, even now, even if I don't need them, I like kind of poke my head down that aisle. Like, how are we doing? I think we're all doing that to just say, you know what? We should have some wipes on. Right. And we use them every day here to clean things up. Mm -hmm. So I'm always buying them when they're available. (laughs) Good. Yeah, it was about this time last year, right? That I I was in a store and I saw that aisle and I was like, oh. This uh, is a thing. Uh, We're going oh. to be doing this. Uh, yeah. Hard to believe it's been a year. Uh, getting close to the official start of spring. That's coming up later this month on the 20th. Our time change is coming up this weekend, though. So, yeah, brace yourselves for that. We spring forward here in the next few days. It's felt a lot like spring the past couple of days. Warm and muggy out there. And we had a lot of clouds around today. It's tried to break up this afternoon. And then we had a nice influx of some high clouds from the west there that you can see on our 
time lapse. I do think we'll be able to see a bit more blue sky tomorrow afternoon, and that should help to boost our temperatures just a few more degrees compared to where they were today. Uh, but a lot of additional mid and high level cloud cover off to the west of 35 and radar was picking up on some really, really light returns, especially down to the south of Del Rio between about Del Rio and Eagle Pass. So I can't rule out that there were a few sprinkles there a bit closer to the border, maybe into a portion of Kinney County, but essentially just a lot of cloud cover, especially off to our west this evening. 78 now in San Antonio, 82 in Carrizo Springs, 72 in Del Rio. So it was a touch cooler from Valverde County up into portions of Edwards, Real counties today with that additional high cloud cover around. Uh, it has been another windy day. Our wind gusts were up as high as about 35, 40 miles per hour at times this afternoon. They have relaxed a lot already this evening, but still picking up on a couple of gusts up closer to 25, 30 miles per hour. And generally speaking, our wind gusts will come down this evening, tonight, and through the first part of the day tomorrow. But just like today, tomorrow will be another windy, even gusty day at times with our wind gusts up closer to 35, pushing 40 miles per hour at times again Thursday. And again, I think we could see some similar wind gust numbers on Friday, even into Saturday afternoon. So the wind will continue to be a factor over the next couple of days. Temperature wise through tomorrow morning, mid to upper 60s for a lot of us cloudy skies. I can't rule out a few little sprinkles, maybe some patchy drizzle early tomorrow and then tomorrow afternoon again. I expect a little bit more blue sky than what we saw today and that'll help to boost our temperatures for a lot of us back in the low to mid 80s. We'll go right around 83 here in San Antonio, 85 Del Rio, 84 Eagle Pass and a few spots down to the southwest. You saw 90 today. You could certainly see the low 90s again tomorrow afternoon and things really won't change much over the next couple of days. We are waiting on the circulation over California over on the West Coast to get to us here in Texas and it will be moving pretty slowly the next couple of days. So that's why we're going to keep you warm, humid and windy Thursday, Friday and through much of the day on Saturday. It won't be until very late Saturday night, really the overnight hours. I think that we're going to see a front move through thanks to this low pressure system as it comes off the Rocky Mountains. Now, any concern for some widespread severe weather as we get into Saturday night? That's going to be up well to our north, and I'll show you that map here in just a minute. But uh, keep in mind here, our rain chances will peak late Saturday. I can't rule out a couple of isolated spotty showers during the day Saturday, Saturday afternoon, but it will be Saturday night that our rain chances peak. Again, any concern for organized severe weather, widespread severe weather Saturday, that's going to be north of us, really north of the Austin area, up closer to the I-20 corridor. So when you see that chance of storms, don't want you to be overly concerned about severe weather. There certainly could be some rumbles of thunder, but again, hopefully we'll just get a nice dash of some rainfall as we get into late Saturday night. We'll clear out beautifully by Sunday. One more look at your day tomorrow, 65 in the morning, 83 in the afternoon. Windy conditions continue not only tomorrow, but for the next couple of days. So looking ahead to the weekend, if you want to pick a better weather day, I think it's definitely going to be Sunday with the return of sunshine. Guys. Could use some of that rain, though. It would be nice. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. In case you missed it, coming up next. In the buzz today, after five years, Taco Bell's quesalupa is back. It's like a quesadilla with an added crispy chalupa shell that creates a double layer of beef, lettuce, cheddar cheeses, diced tomatoes, and sour cream. The fan favorite originally debuted back in 2016. Taco Bell says this iteration has 50% more cheese. You had me at Taco Bell. <laughs> the quesalupa costs about $3. It will be available Thursday for a limited time, but if you use the Taco Bell app, you can start ordering the quesalupa on Wednesday. Mm, now I want Taco Bell for dinner. <laughs> Cue the folk tunes because today is International Bagpipes Day. First celebrated in 2012, the day was founded to help showcase the traditional music to the world. While most people associate bagpipes with kilted Scotsmen, the instrument is played all over the world. The earliest bagpipes may actually date back to Rome and Greece. They are often played at funerals or somber occasions, but of course, March 17th, you'll likely hear Irish folk tunes from bands in St. Patrick's Day parades. Now let's take a look at today's In Case You Missed It. It's Wednesday, March 10th. Happy Wednesday. Thanks for joining us this morning. New this morning, Castle Hills police say one man is in custody after leading them on a chase overnight. Started just after one this morning on Jackson Keller near Loop 410. Castle Hills police say the driver took off when he saw officers nearby. That's when the driver turned down a street. Police say he crashed through a lock gate 
at the Elon Gardens apartment and into a parked truck. Officers say he tried to get out and run, but they tased him and arrested him. New at five, a shootout between two groups caught on camera. Now the Bear County Sheriff's Office is hoping you can help them find those suspects. Take a look in a video posted on Facebook. The Sheriff's Office says this happened Sunday morning at the Daiquiri Lounge on FM 78 near Crestway. That's over in Converse. In the video, you see three people exchanging gunfire before they take off in a silver SUV and a silver Chevy Malibu. Time the Department of Health and Human Services expected to buy another 100 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Right now, it's unclear how long it'll take for those doses to be created and then distributed. The Biden administration hopes to have enough vaccine for every U.S. adult by the end of May. President Biden's massive $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill clearing its final hurdle on Capitol Hill. On this vote, the yeas are 220, the nays are 211. The motion is adopted. The House with the final sign off on Senate changes to the bill, including narrowing eligibility for stimulus checks and taking out the House approved federal minimum wage increase. <laughs> We've got a few more warm, humid and windy days ahead until a front sweeps through Saturday night. That'll bring a chance of some showers and storms, but the sun will be back in a big way by Sunday. Guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. And thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Have a good evening.